Today on the Matt Wall Show, the media have gone to insane lengths in their smear campaign against conservatives in the wake of the Colorado shooting. This includes the most egregious case of defamation I've ever seen, and I'm, I happen to be the target of it. Also, the left have uh, gone all in with their defenses of child drag shows and drag queen story hours. But why are they so desperate to keep exposing children to this kind of debauchery? I think I know why, and I'll explain. And woke white journalists are virtue signaling in Qatar, and it isn't going exactly well for them. Plus, a quantum physicist tries to prove that, quote, the universe is queer. All of that and more today on The Matt Walsh Show. Roe versus Wade has been overturned, and this battle is now finally leaving D.C. and going to the grassroots. And no group in America is better positioned than 40 Days for Life uh, in this moment in history. With about 1 million, 1 million volunteers in 1,000 cities, 40 Days for Life holds peaceful vigils outside abortion facilities. They have a larger presence, presence in uh, blue states, with California being the largest state. Some former abortion facility directors say these vigils can cause the, the abortion no-show rate to go as high as 75%, which is detrimental, of course, to their abortion business. These law-abiding vigils have closed many abortion businesses in America, and nearly half of those closed abortion facilities were in liberal cities where abortion will remain legal, including closures in San Francisco, Chicago, and Seattle. 40 Days for Life is effectively changing hearts and minds in the grassroots to end abortion. You can check out their locations, podcasts, and free magazine at 40daysforlife.com. And remember, this fight is far from over. We still have so much more to do. So if you want more information and join the fight on 40 Days for Life, go to 40daysforlife.com. Well, if you thought that the media's exploitation of the gay club shooting in Colorado Springs had reached its most depraved lengths yesterday when we first discussed it on this show, then you haven't been paying very close attention. Uh, because whenever you think they have sunk as low as they can sink, there's always a still deeper depth to reach, and they will reach it. By God, they will reach it. Uh, we still have been given no official information about the shooter's motives, but that hasn't slowed them down at all. On the contrary, the lack of information only frees the media up to z disseminate even more wild and unhinged propaganda. The media is in a race against the clock always when something like this happens, because they need to get all the talking points they can out into circulation before the relevant facts are actually known. That way, whenever they are known, if they ever are, uh, it won't matter because the lie has already, as the saying goes, traveled halfway around the world. As we talked about yesterday, the ambulance chasing vultures immediately identified a number of villains in the shooting, people to blame for the shooting. The shooter himself barely even makes the list of people to blame. Certainly, they won't blame the court system that allowed this man to Rome free after he was arrested for serious felonies last year, including three counts of first-degree kidnapping. Instead, they've singled out primarily Tucker Carlson, Donald Trump, because, of course, uh, libs of TikTok, and then me. I have been blamed by name in many major media outlets, but it was the Daily Coast yesterday afternoon that won the defamation competition. They published this headline. This is what they published. Matt Walsh only upset, quote, more people weren't killed at Club Q. Twitter takes highlight GOP hypocrisy. Notice the quotes. They put the phrase, more people weren't killed, in quotes, in a clear and deliberate attempt to give the impression that I had said that myself. Of course, I said no such thing and never would, because unlike the staff at the Daily Coast, I am not a psychopath. And if you read the article, it says, it begins, quote, it wasn't enough that five people died and 25 were injured when an LGBTQ club was the target of a mass shooting on Saturday night in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Right-wing commentator Matt Walsh kept spreading hate about a community already suffering largely because of a concentrated effort from Republicans to translate misguided fear about the trans community into political power. Quote, leftists are using a mass shooting to try and blackmail us into accepting the castration and sexualization of children, Walsh tweeted. These people are just beyond evil. I have never felt more motivated to oppose everything they stand for with every fiber of my being. Despicable scumbags. Now, yeah, I did tweet that, okay? And the Daily Coast is certainly not doing anything to disprove my thesis that these people are despicable scum. But it's not until later in the article, buried four paragraphs down, that they reveal the source of the wants more people killed quote. It wasn't from me, but from a trans activist, an all-around loathsome dirtbag named Alejandro uh, Caraballo. But of course, most people don't read the article, especially when it's published by the Daily Coast, and how can you blame them? All they will see is the headline, which is intended to give the impression that I said what the trans activist actually said. Interesting to note here that the writer of this article is a woman named Lauren Sue, S-U-E. 
Her last name well, may well be a glance into her own future. Our team at The Daily Wire has already sent an email to The Daily Coast demanding a retraction and apology. By the way, just deleting it is not going to be enough. Retract it and apologize to me personally. We've also referred it to our general counsel. You know, I understand that the left is used to playing the game by a different set of rules, but um, there are limits and they have crossed a line here. Not just crossed it. I mean, they are several miles over the line at this point. And we're not going to tolerate that. There will be a penalty. We'll have, I'll have more to say about that in the coming days. Um, but there's something else notable happening here. Aside from the egregious smear campaign against me personally, the left has also identified this as an opportunity to launch a full-fledged campaign to defend and normalize child drag shows and drag queen story hours. Now, there's no indication still that the shooting had anything to do with any of that. And even if it did, I mean, even if, it's an if, the shooter was in part upset about drag queen, drag queens grooming children, that obviously wouldn't mean that it's actually good for drag queens to groom children. Be that as it may, the mainstream news channels yesterday filled their airwaves with over-the-top superlatives for men who enjoy cross-dressing in front of children. For example, here was journalist, in quotes, and he quotes for that for sure, Brandy Zadrovsny on NBC. Here's what she said. We've also seen, and, and there was a lot of conversation about this, um, the Denver Post covered it, about drag shows being targeted. What is going on with that? Yeah, because they targeted drag shows a lot, and in part because um, Drag Time Story Hour, where a drag queen would come, it was a ubiquitous in libraries all over the country had it. A drag queen would come read a story. It was fun. The kids loved it. Um, and then also some sort of um, friendly, friendly drag shows. It would be on a Sunday brunch. You could bring the kids. They'd see a show. And the far right conservatives left on this and they put it together with, frankly, the QAnon narrative that's been out. And it was they're out to get your children. The demonization, dehumanization, and moral panic around children in our community somehow being threatened by LGBTQ teachers, librarians, performers, that is the thread that's going through. And when you demonize someone to that extent and you make them feel like an existential threat to you and your children, it's no wonder, again, that we get this kind of violence. Drag Queen Story Hour was ubiquitous, she claims. She wants to make Drag Queen Story Hour seem like a tried and true American tradition something you could trace back to the founders and which far-right extremists suddenly decided to have a problem with because of QAnon. They're actually QAnon conspiracy theorists. This has been the tactic. NBC's Ben Collins took a similar line. Here's what he said. How significant are those two dates? Yeah, and, and also hours before a, a, what they called an all-ages drag brunch, which is probably the number one target of these uh, anti-LGBTQ um, uh, events recently. Like, for example, the Proud Boys will go and protest any drag brunch, any um, any drag story hour, anything that a child might go to meet a, a drag queen, not, you know, just to show them that they're human beings and people. They talk, they, they go there and they, they read Dr. Seuss there. They read uh, regular books, uh, but it's read by a drag queen and they, you know, they have breakfast. Uh, it is not some hypersexual event, but that's what it's viewed as on the far right. Mm-hmm. And these spaces have become dangerous places of real life information warfare. There's Proud Boys showing up on one side. Sometimes people like local Antifa members show up on the other side as a as a way to it. It, be, it becomes a place where kids aren't safe, not because of the event itself, but because of this culture war that's been propped up uh, on top of it. Uh, and uh, that's not something that should happen. This is not something you know. These people should be able to live their lives. Uh, without fear of being murdered, literally. Uh, but right now, that's the sort of climate that's been created by uh, anti-LGBTQ uh, protesters and, frankly, bigots. Hmm. Frankly, bigots. The kids go to the drag show or drag story hour to meet drag queens, he says. Doesn't see anything creepy about that. Of course, he fails to mention that the kids don't go there, okay? They, they, don't, they don't, like, get in the car and drive there themselves. They are taken there. No child is asking to spend an afternoon meeting drag queens. Mommy, daddy, can we go see a drag queen today? Kids aren't doing that. If the child's being raised properly, he doesn't even know what a drag queen is. My kids have never asked me that because, uh, number one, I'm, I'm raising my children to be normal children. And number two, they have no idea what a drag queen is. They've never been exposed to it. 
because they're kids. These concepts are introduced by adults, and the adults take the child to, quote, meet the drag queen. And why do they meet them? Well, Ben says to make them, the drag queens, feel like human beings. At least he has the order right. The drag shows, a drag story hours, they exist, even according to its defenders, for the sake of the drag queens themselves. The cross-dressing men want to do this in front of children, and so children are offered up for the purpose of satiating this strange desire. Somehow, the way to make them feel human, to make them feel alive, to make them feel like people, is to let them cross-dress in front of kids. Not just to let them cross-dress, but to let them cross-dress in front of kids. These drag queens, they, according to Ben, they don't feel human unless they're allowed to wear women's clothing in front of kids. Now, Ben is lying, of course, when he says that they just read Dr. Seuss. Obviously, the books they read are almost always LGBT propaganda because that's the point of the event. The combination of children and drag queens, as has a, this is something that has a clear and recent history. It doesn't go back into ancient history. It's recent. In fact, Chris Rufo, another culprit in the mass shooting, according to the media, had a report a few weeks ago about the ideological origins of Drag Queen Story Hour. As he notes, quote, Enterprising queer theorists use the commercialization of drag and the goodwill associated with the gay and lesbian rights movement as a means of transforming drag performances into family-friendly events that could transmit a simplified version of queer theory to children. The key figure in this transition was a genderqueer college professor and drag queen named Harris Kornstein, stage name Little Miss Hot Mess, who hosted some of the original readings in public libraries and sits on the board of the Drag Queen Story Hour nonprofit organization founded by Michelle T. in 2015 to promote children's drag performances. Kornstein also co-wrote the manifesto for the movement called Drag Pedagogy, the Playful Practice of Queer Imagination in Early Childhood. They uh, propose, the writers do, drag pedagogy as a new teaching method designed to stimulate the, quote, queer imagination, teaching kids, quote, how to live queerly. Though Drag Queen Story Hour events are often billed as family-friendly, Kornstein and Keenan, the writers, explain that this is a form of code. Quote, here, DQSH, Drag Queen Story Hour, is family-friendly in the sense of family as an old-school queer code to identify and connect with other queers on the street. That is, the goal is not to reinforce the biological family, but to facilitate the child's transition into the ideological family. Okay, so the drag queens who came up with this stuff said that this is family-friendly in the sense of queer code when they say family in the sense of meeting other queers on the street. That's according to them. That's the kind of family-friendly environment. The environment where you meet other queers on the street. That's the environment that they're putting kids in. That's the sort of family they're trying to connect kids to. So we see that Drag Queen Story Hour and family-friendly drag shows, quote-unquote, have two purposes. One, from the drag queen's perspective, is to satisfy their fetish for cross-dressing in front of children. The other, on a more macro level, is to indoctrinate children into queer theory. To put it simply, the point of Drag Queen Story Hour and the child, the, the supposed family-friendly drag shows is to turn your children queer. That is the goal. And whenever you say that, what I just said right there is going to be clipped by Media Matters. Hello, everybody on Twitter. Um, the people who invented it stated explicitly that that is the point, to help children live queerly. That's their quote. And the thing about the left is that what they believe and what they do all of it is so horrifying, so perverse, so degraded, that if you just quote them, then you somehow sound like the crazy one. If you quote what they are saying, it, may, it sounds crazy just to say it out loud because it's so horrifying. Yet it's true. And this is the reason the left cares so much about this and they defend it so vigorously. Because according to the left, think about this. According to the left, the drag queen child combination has become dangerous. They say it's a lightning rod for violent backlash, right? That's what they say. And it's greatly exaggerated, of course. Mostly it's invented out of whole cloth, actually. But, but even by their version of events, if it's causing this much chaos and violence, why do you insist on continuing to do it? If, if according to you, it's like putting people's lives at risk, 
If, if the effort to have men cross-dress in front of children is putting people's lives at risk, why are you still doing it? Is it that important to you? Now, as always, they try to flip the burden around on us. They demand that we explain why we object to children being exposed to drag queens, and we can explain it, and we have, and we will continue to because it's very easy to explain. Drag is inherently sexual and ideological. It is burlesque, and it's not appropriate to bring your child to a burlesque show. You disgusting freaks. But why should we be the only ones explaining? Instead of asking why we oppose it so much, we should ask why they support it so much that according to them, they will keep doing it at the risk of life and limb. Why is it so important to you to cross-dress in front of children? Why is it so important? Why do you need to do it? Why? Is it worth the cost that you claim you're paying for it? Why do you have to do this? Why can't you just not do it? How is that? Is, would that be a fight? If it is really causing all this chaos, again, that's your version. I don't uh, uh, agree with that. You're exaggerating. But according to you, that's what you're saying. Is it why? Nearly all children lived and grew up in this country for almost two centuries without ever being involved in or exposed to a drag show. And they were not any worse off for it. This is not filling some sort of need that children had. So why do you act like it's some sort of desperate need now? Why can't you just not do it? Is it that hard to not cross-dress in front of kids? Is the compulsion that overwhelming? Well, we know the answer, even if you won't say it. This is part of your childhood indoctrination campaign. It's an important part. And you must indoctrinate them young, you realize, because the older they get, they get, the more they will see you for what you are and your agenda for what it is. And that's what this is really about. Now let's get to our five headlines. Living a healthy lifestyle is not especially easy, especially when you're on the road as much as I am. I need easy, manageable routines, which is why I am a huge fan of Balance of Nature. Balance of Nature fruits and veggies are the best way to make sure you're getting essential nutritional ingredients every single day. Their products are 100% whole food. Balance of Nature uses a cold vacuum process that preserves the natural phytonutrients in whole fruits and vegetables and encapsulates them for easy consumption. Balance of Nature sent a bunch of their products down to the studio for my team to try, and we all love them. When you're uh, disciplined enough to take care of your health, you reap all kinds of benefits, more energy, less fatigue, better focus. Consuming the right balances of fruits and vegetables every day is an important first step. So go to balanceofnature.com. Use promo code Walsh for 35% off your first order as a preferred customer. That is balanceofnature.com, promo code Walsh for 35% off your first preferred order. You know, one positive I have noticed amid this propaganda campaign from the left um, in the wake of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the tragedy in Colorado is that, you know, they're getting more and more desperate because they realize that their tactics actually aren't working. So the left, they rely on. We know that they can't defend or explain their positions. You know, we know, we know that. And as we said, when it comes to drag queen story hour and like, why do you need to combine kids and drag queens? Why is that so important to you? Why can't you just stop? Um, they won't say out loud. They can't answer the question. They, they, like, there's no answer they can give to that that wouldn't sound completely disgusting. And so instead, they just try to deflect and make us put us on the defense. But, you know, so, so because they can't defend it, what they rely on is... Censorship, obviously, and also self-censorship. So two kinds of censorship. There's the, you know, the, the, the censorship on their part, the active kind of censorship, where they're stopping us from, from communicating our points of view, shutting us down. But then there's also self-censorship, where they berate us so much and lie and defame us so much and threaten so much that we just stop, we ourselves stop saying whatever it is they don't want us to say. And for a long time, both of these, they had a lot of success in both areas. But in, in recent weeks, months, you know, um, in recent times, in both areas, they're starting to lose. When it comes to censorship, well, they've lost Twitter. Um, it would seem anyway that they've, that they've lost Twitter. It certainly is not the censorship mechanism. We already know it's not the censorship mechanism that it used to be. 
Now, there's a lot that remains to be seen, but but uh, uh, Elon Musk has already invited not just Donald Trump, but a whole bunch of people on the right back to the platform. So they don't have that tool anymore to the extent that they used to. And even self-censorship. You know, they're starting to realize that they can go around, they can blame us for mass shootings, they can call us this and that, and it just doesn't, it just rolls off our back. Nothing you people say means anything to us. It doesn't mean anything because we know you're full of garbage and everything you say is a lie. And so it just doesn't matter. You, you, can, it, you can say whatever you want. Well, you can't say whatever you want. If you get into defamation, then, then we're going to sue your asses. But uh, beyond that, if you want to, you know, whatever, whatever insinuations, insults, whatever labels you want to put, just doesn't have any effect. And they're noticing that. Because in the past, you know, the way this would have gone is that uh, there is a terrible mass shooting. They erroneously blame us and say that our anti-groomer stance has caused this. And then they shot it from the rooftops. And then a lot of people on the right say, well, we better not talk about this anymore. Even though what they're saying is totally bogus. We're, you know, it's, it's they're mad at us and let's stop talking about it. But that's not the reaction on the right anymore. It's not, that's not how the new right operates. The new right says, yeah, I, it's, you can say whatever you want. You could go on CNN every single day and scream about it. It doesn't matter. You have no control over us. You have no power. And that makes them desperate and afraid and frantic. And when it comes to this, they are just, they, they don't know what to do. Because they're saying to themselves, wait a second, we're using a mass shooting against you. We're using a mass shooting against you. We're using a mass shooting as a political pawn, and, 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 and that's not enough to, to make you all uh, fall silent? In the past, that would always work. These days, it doesn't. And they're desperate. Speaking of desperate, on The View yesterday, I just want to play this for you. It's not exactly a lead headline, but uh, we were talking about all this yesterday, and, and uh, Jesus, you know, it's, it's one thing to defame libs of TikTok or me or Chris Ruffo or Donald Trump or, you know, one of the usual suspects. That's one thing. Um, of course, infinitely more outrageous and offensive is when they try to drag Jesus Christ into this, which is what they did on The View. Listen to this. They were in a place that accepts them for who they were, and someone came to that place. And that's and what's so the, sad. The and part, I don't know that they hide behind religion, because that, I said this on this show once before. Jesus would be the grand marshal at the pride parade. I don't mean I about really, gay really people. I mean that. in every argument we have. But here's you weaponize religion. religion. Here's my question. Religion, but it's wrong. Mm -hmm. If you're so afraid... Why are you going over there? Yeah. If they scare you so much, leave them alone. When stuff scares me, I leave it alone. Mm -hmm. If I don't want to be bothered, I don't go there. See, that's the problem. You don't want to just have your feelings. You want everybody else to join you. And you know what? You can, you can scream. You can cuss. You can do all the things that you say. But you know what? Gay people are here. They're not going anywhere. There is nothing you can do. You know, you can yell and scream. But, you know, as, as the Lord, as everybody was talking about, you know, made in God's image. Yep. Made in God's image. There are no but except for. There's none of that. No. Keep that in mind when you're trying to figure out where you stand as a human being, let alone a Christian. We'll be right back. It's, I mean, it's just amazing. She, she says, you can't just have your feelings. You need everyone else to join you. What? That, that's, that's the left to a T. That's the perfect uh, way of describing the left, especially the LGBT left and gender ideology. You can't just have your feelings. You need everyone to join you. You can't just feel like the opposite gender. You need everyone else to join you in affirming you in that. But what I really appreciate is that the one chick at the beginning starts by saying, um, and I, I honestly don't know any of their names except for Who Whoopi Goldberg and Joy. So I know those two. The other two I don't know. But the other, however many it is. Um, the chick at the beginning says that they're weaponizing religion. They use religion. And then for the rest of the segment, all the other women on the panel do what she just accused conservatives of doing. They, they start using religion to weaponize it against their opponents. So they're like contradicting exactly what she just said. And what we hear from one of them is that um, Jesus would have been the grand marshal at the pride parade. Would have been the grand marshal. Well, 
That's wrong on uh, many levels, but let's talk about two of them. One is really basic here, is that Jesus would not be the grand marshal of any parade that has pride in the title. Because pride is identified in Scripture repeatedly and by Jesus himself repeatedly as a sin. Okay, Have, pride is a sin. Now, it's one thing, the, the English language sometimes falls short when it comes to translating biblical texts. And so we have to, we have to kind of figure out what is meant by pride because you can have, you, know, you could say that, I, I could say I'm proud of my children, I'm proud of my family. Uh, you could even have pride in accomplishments. You know, if you accomplish something, you can say, I'm proud of doing that. I'm proud of the work that I did. Nothing wrong with any of that because you're taking pride in something else, right? You're taking pride in achievement, something that was done. You're taking pride in, in someone else, a, a family member. You know, that's just, uh, which is another way of saying love. It's just you, you love them. Um, the kind of pride that we're warned about in Scripture is this kind of haughty, vain, self-centered, egotistical, I am the center of the universe kind of pride, which is exactly the sort of pride that the pride parade is designed to uh, communicate and convey and celebrate. It's all about me. Hey, that, that's what the whole pride parade is, right? It's just, everyone, look at me, look at me. That's all it is. So it doesn't even matter the context. Whatever the context, if, if you're engaging in that kind of pride, Jesus is not going to uh, celebrate it with you. He's going to have some stern words for you about uh, turning from your sin. But then there is also the context to, take, to keep in mind here. And, and, you know, because you brought it up, right? They brought it up. They brought up the Bible. They brought up Christianity. You brought it up. And so we must inform you that what you're saying about Christian teaching and about Scripture is just incorrect. The Bible does, in fact, in both the Old and New Testament, in very explicit terms, um, uh, uh, lay out the, the homosexual act as a sin. You know, in fact, any sexual act that happens outside of the bonds of marriage is a sin, according to Christian sexual morality, biblical sexual morality. And also according to the Bible, marriage is between a man and a woman. That's what it says. Now, you can, it, now, if you're on the view or someone aligned with them, you can say, well, I don't care what the Bible says. All right, but you... But you're the one who brought it up. Like, you just brought it up. So they try to do both. This is their game. And in that clip, you heard both. On one hand, oh, no one cares what the Bible says. Don't use your religion. And then on the other hand, and by the way, I'll tell you what your religion says about this. And the game is that if, if you correct them on what your religion says, then they can revert back to the first talking point and says, why are you talking about religion? You brought it up. So... They can make whatever claim they want about your religion, and if you correct them and say, well, actually, you're wrong. It's not what our religion teaches. I, can I, as a member of my own religion, can I tell you? I mean, you're a bunch of atheist, secular, godless uh, humanists. Can I, can, I, can I tell you as a member of that religion what it? No, no, I'll, I'll speak for you, they say. It's totally absurd. All right. This is from Euronews.com. I don't think I've ever uh, read a headline from them. It says, an American journalist has claimed that he was detained on Monday after trying to enter World, the World Cup Stadium in Qatar, where same-sex relationships are outlawed, while wearing a rainbow shirt in support of the LGBT community. So this is Grant Wall is his name. And he put a picture up there very proudly. He's got the, he's got the rainbow flag. And he says, just now, security guard refusing to let me into the stadium for USA Wales you have to change your shirt. It's not allowed, he says. Uh, he says that he was um, taken away and that he was detained for nearly a half hour. But then he says that they uh, that they later apologized to him and let him into the let him into the country. So that, that's what he says happened. And we're seeing stunts like this, and it, usually the stunt is is quickly abandoned. There have been various, including the USA team. You know, originally they were talking about rainbow flags changing the uniform, and they didn't really end up doing that, but they did have, I think in their practice facility, they had the rainbow flags all over the place. So we're getting this from these, from uh, some of these Western people that are showing up there. Um, but you just see, it's interesting how quickly the respect all cultures stuff goes out the window, isn't it? I mean, say what you want, but 
This is Qatar. It's their country. It's a non-Western, non-white country. And now you've got white people, white Westerners like Grant Wall, showing up and saying, I don't respect your customs. I don't, I don't respect your, your beliefs. I'm going to do what I want in your country. I'm going to tell you how you should run your country. Your laws don't mean anything to me because I'm the white Western guy. And I'll, I'll tell you, I will inform, I will show up and be, and be, the, uh, and, and be the, the, the arbiter of morality, the source of morality. It is a, it is a, a form of this kind of moral colonialism that you see from the West, this ideological colonialism that you see almost uniquely these days from the left. And yet, in any other context, these same people would claim that they're all about multiculturalism. Well, you don't care about multiculturalism if you're not accepting a person's culture, including the parts of it you don't like. So if you're saying, I'm a multiculturalist, I enjoy multiculturalism, um, I enjoy all cultures and I respect all cultures, except for the parts of those cultures I don't personally prefer and that don't line up with my values. Well, if that's the case, then you don't believe in multiculturalism and you don't respect other cultures. It's kind of like saying, I respect all free speech except for the speech that I don't like. Well, then you don't respect free speech. So it all goes out the window immediately. And also, I, I do have to say, and there have been uh, some you know, Qatari citizens who have uh, spoken out about this. Here's one, for example, says, as a Qatari, I'm proud of what happened. I don't know when will the Westerners realize that their values aren't universal. There are other cultures with different values that should be equally respected. Let's not forget that the West is not the spokesperson for humanity. Now, we talked about this a little bit yesterday, and um, you had the, the president of FIFA that was saying, well, the West has a lot to apologize for. But he meant historically. He was taking about th- taking him back 3,000 years. And so he was doing the whole white guilt routine, going back 3,000 years and all of our, and all of our dastardly sins. Um, that is absurd. But if we're talking about modern day, if we're talking about the West in, the, in, in modern times, the West right now, I would agree that we just are not in a position to morally lecture anyone, I'm afraid to say. We in the West are not in a position so we can put ourselves on a pedestal and say, oh, those, look at those, those Qataris and their disgusting laws. They have no respect for human decency. We're just not in a position to assume the moral high ground. We don't have the moral high ground. We surrendered it in this country. We did. It's very sad to say, but it's true. I mean, like we talked about yesterday, we, we live in a country... Uh, in, 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 in modern times where we execute, we've executed 60 million babies in the womb. 60 million. And if you believe that those are human beings, then you believe that in our country, we, and I say we in the general sense, are responsible for arguably the worst mass slaughter of the innocent that's ever happened on the planet. And then to make matters worse, we also castrate, sterilize our kids. We don't even have a, 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 a sense of, you know, what a man or woman is anymore. We're just utterly, completely confused. We celebrate evil and debauchery in its most deranged forms. That's what we do in this country. And then we think that we're in a position to go and ideologically colonize the globe and tell them they need to be more like us. Well, the problem is that the other countries, when we say that, when we give that pitch and we say, you should be more like us. Well, the members of the other country, they look at us like freaks. They look at us like a bunch of confused weirdos. They, they, they look at us and say, well, I don't, I don't want to be like you. Why would I want to be like you? You mean over in your country where you think that, that men can get pregnant? You mean over in your country where you're, you're sterilizing little boys to turn them into girls? You are surgically and medically altering little boys to make them girls and you think we want to be like you? It's just, it's not a convincing sales pitch. I noticed this when I was over, uh, when we were in Kenya, and it was, it was very sad to see that the people in Kenya, they look at America now with, uh, it really, it's like a, it's almost like a paternalistic pity, like a kind of, they're there, you sad, confused children sort of thing when they hear about what's happening here. And can you blame them? You saw in the film, I asked uh, one of them, you know, uh, would you ever want to move to America? And they laughed. They laughed at the idea that they would ever want to move here. 
That's what we have made of ourselves on the uh, world stage. Remember when Donald Trump was president, we heard so much uh, hand-wringing and fretting from the left about how we won't be respected on the world stage. Well, the countries, they don't care about who the president is, whether it's Donald Trump or someone else. It's about the culture. Okay, they're not, they're not looking at our politics. They're looking at our culture. And these non-Western countries are seeing our culture and seeing a culture that, has, that is just caving in on itself, that is eating itself. And uh, they're saying, I just, I'm not interested in your moral lectures. Can you blame them? I can't. I just can't. All right. Let's see. What else do we got here? Kamala Harris was in the uh, Philippines. And, you know, it's been a little serious, a little dark. Let's, let's, uh, let's lighten the mood a little bit. Because Kamala Harris has some inspirational words to offer the, the uh, folks in the Philippines. And also all across the world. Let's listen. The way that I think about it is, you know, like relay racing, you know, you race and someone passes the baton and then, right? So that's what life is. It's basically a relay race. And so the people who are heroes, whichever gender they are, they ran their part of the race and then they passed us a baton. And the question is, what will we do with the time we carry the baton? which means there's no time to get tired, come on, <laughs> right? You're gonna pass that baton at some point, but right now you're carrying it. And the question is, what are you doing with it? Mm. Inspirational stuff from Kamala Harris. As, as always, she's got that confident look on her face. She believes she's nailing it. She's got something really profound to say, these faux profundities to offer about uh, passing the, it's the, it's the, the relay race of life. You know, she thought about, she, you know she'd been working on that for a long time. She felt really proud of that. And, in, in, you know, to, to her credit, it, it is basically coherent, so I'll give her that. But even that, it's like, this is the position they're on in the Democrat Party. And on the left, this is the position they're in. Or even some, even just some like cliche platitude like that. The relay race of life. Carry the baton. They can't even say that stuff anymore because that's not what they actually do, right? They're, they're not taking the baton from past generations, from our ancestors, and just running forward. No, they, they take the baton and then they, they stand there on the track and look at it and say, this is disgusting. I don't want to, what are we doing here? This is, I don't want to take a baton from you. You bigots, get away from me. They won't even take the baton. They, they're standing on the track, like getting into an argument with the guy who's trying to pass the baton to them. Here, go, keep, keep going. We, we've, this is the country we've built for you so far. There's still a lot of work to do, but, but just keep going. No, I know better than you. So they, they actually will not take the baton from past generations. They're too busy, you know, tearing down the statues. They, 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 the guy tries to hand the baton, they, they kneecap him, leave him there on the track. That's what the left does. All right, I've had this for a couple of days. I wanted to mention, and this is from Washington Post. It says, federal agents and prosecutors have come to believe former President Donald Trump's motive for allegedly taking and keeping classified documents was largely his ego and a desire to hold on to the materials as trophies or mementos, according to people familiar with the matter. As part of the organization, federal authorities reviewed the classified documents that were recovered from Trump's Mar-a-Lago home and his private club, looking to see if the types of information contained in them pointed to any kind of pattern or similarity, according to the people who spoke on a condition of anonymity to discuss the ongoing investigation. The review has not found any apparent business advantages to the types of classified information in Trump's possession, these people said. And then it, it uh, continues with more details. But this is just any, any person with a brain and who is able to assess stories involving Donald Trump honestly, and this is a, that's, a, that's a small minority of people who are capable to do that, capable of doing that, but anyone in that category, such as myself, already knew this. Like the idea that Donald Trump took classified documents to, to what, sell them to the Russians or to engage in espionage, that this was some sort of high level crime that he had cooked up? Obviously not. That was always obviously the case. It's, it's Donald Trump. Why did he keep the documents? Well, because he felt like keeping them. He just, want, he just wanted to have them. He didn't really think it mattered if he kept them or not. That's it. That's, that's why he took them. That's why he had them. Uh, that's all there is to it. 
But it, it shows that, that you know, for, for the media, this is a revelation. This is months after the fact. They're saying, well, maybe. Maybe he wasn't trying to sell it to Putin. Maybe it's just like he just thought it was a memento he could keep. Which is, which is, which is I mean, love him or hate him, right? It's like, that's a very Donald Trump thing. He says, I want to keep these documents. I just like to have them. Uh, that was always going to be the case, but it, but it shows how Trump's enemies, they still, even now, all these years later, after he's already been in the White House, they, they still don't understand him, which, which is an advantage that he continues to have over them, that they, they, they do not understand him. They don't understand what makes him tick. They don't understand why he does the things that he does because they have totally bought into this cartoon villain narrative where, where Trump is just that. He's a comic book villain. And everything he does, it's with the most nefarious and int- possible intentions. So whatever Trump is doing, just imagine the most evil reason why a person might do that. And it must be that reason. Because he's literally Hitler, they think. When most of the time, it's just sort of innocuous. And this stuff with the, with the classified documents, like many of us were saying from the beginning, it's just innocuous. It's nothing. They were just, they were just boxes of paperwork. He didn't do anything with them. All right, before we get to the uh, comment section, I I feel as though I just have to play this for you because I I feel as though it's only fair if we talk about this and acknowledge it because I can be critical of adult men, speaking of comic books, who take comic book movies and video games too seriously. They get too invested in them. But sports can have the same infantilizing effect if you don't moderate yourself. So this is kind of a cautionary tale. And I'm a sports fan. And so, and this is something that I hear anytime that I complain about uh, adults who play too many video games or are too obsessed with superheroes, what I hear in response is, well, what about you as a sports fan? How is that any more mature? And it's actually a good point. Because if you get too invested in it, if you take it too seriously as an adult, then it, it, it becomes quite absurd. So again, a cautionary tale. Here's an exchange that happened yesterday on a Fox sports show called Undisputed. This is a, an exchange, a, a show hosted by Shannon Sharp, former NFL player and a, this uh, sports gas bag called Skip Bayless. And here they are arguing about what grade they would give the quarterback, Baker Mayfield, for his performance on Sunday against the Baltimore Ravens. That's the argument. So there's Baker Mayfield. How did he play? What grade would you give him arbitrarily after the fact? And this is what the argument sounded like. Says he's dead last in QBR. 17 point. We're talking about yesterday. Uh, uh, How did he look yesterday? No, he gets an no, F? no. no. Let me, I got the floor. Uh-huh. Because all you do is bring up those 11 games. All you do is go back and talk about when he was a rookie and won seven games. Mm. I'm going to talk about what I want to talk about because I got the floor. Mm. Baker Mayfield is dead last in 2022 in QBR. Blah, blah, He's blah. dead last. I don't blah, care. Blah, 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 blah. blah. He's 57.8. He's 30, 30 blah, completion blah, percentage. Blah. You going to let me talk? Because that's if what you do. If you stay on point on question. You never stay on point. Okay. I'm I about to stay on point. You know, you're not going to yep. get on point until yep. I'm done talking. Okay, all right. That's right. Spew all your hate. I, I'm going to spew it your all. Your baker hate. Spew it. 17.8. Because all you talk about, you're uncertain about Justin Herbert. But you get on the floor for this clown. He's a bum. He's trash. And you know it. And every time you bring him up, mm. I'm going to let the world know exactly what he uh, is. Oh, you He's have four hundred. Twitter followers. Don't worry about Hold on. Yeah, okay. You talk about Twitter. And yeah. we come out here and discuss topics that you okay. tweeted. So okay. don't give me about that Twitter stuff. Mm. You can talk about my followers all you want. Yeah. But I got the okay. dead to right, and you see how you do America? He talk about my Twitter followers. Mm. That's what I know okay. I got it. All and right. I'm going to continue to go. Right. He's 187. Tell me when it's my it's turn. It's not your turn. Uh, okay. He's still football for, focus blah, got it graded. Blah, blah, blah. 37%. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, go ahead. Blah, blah, blah. That's, that's sports. That is <laughs> that's sports media for you. If you that's what you're missing if you don't watch uh, any sports media. These are grown adults. Like the uh, Shannon Sharp is like in his fifties. Skip Bayless is in his seventies now. He's in his seventies. You say that he's a bad quarterback. I think he's good. I say he's a good quarterback. Not bad. No, he is bad. I think he's good. That's that's the whole that's the whole argument. Grown adults. And look, there's, it's, I, I say with sports the same thing I say with any other record. If you want to play video games, like there's nothing in principle wrong with that. But if you find yourself taking it really seriously, okay, if you play a video game 
and 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 if you like video games, but then if someone else thinks that video games are stupid, and that makes you like that fills you with rage that someone would criticize or not enjoy your favorite recreation, that's an indication that you take this way too seriously because you don't you're not an adult. You're not you're not an intellectual mental adult. You're still a child. You're reacting the way a child does when you take their popsicle away. And it's the same thing with with sports. Nothing wrong with with watching sports, getting into it and all of that. But like is when you see these in there's, there's alcohol involved obviously. Uh, well there might be alcohol involved here too, but there's alcohol involved in the stands, but you see these the, the fans that start like they commit felony assault against each other. You see someone with it with the, with, the, with the other team's colored jersey. You want to kill him, and you end up in you end up in prison for it. Like it's that kind of thing. You're you're not a you're not a you're not a mental adult. You're still a mental child. So any kind of recreation, because we're a very unserious country with unserious people, any kind of recreation can become a barrier to maturity if if you become too invested in it, and you don't supplement this recreation with a, with actual adult interests like you know things like like just reading books and, and and that sort of thing all right so there's the caution let's get to the comment section do you know their name they're the sweet baby gang ivana says well i knew this day would come sadly i don't agree with matt on something soccer is a normal great sport like any other now, what idiot people have made it into is a different topic, has nothing to do with communism. I don't know where he got this concept from, but okay, it was funny. Well, I got it from science. I don't know what to tell you. It's just, a, it is a matter, it's been a scientifically proven that everyone who likes soccer is a communist. And I don't know what else to tell you. It's just, that's, that's where I got it from. I got it from science. And by the way, congratulations to the USA for their victory. I think they won. Didn't they yesterday? Oh, they tied. Congratulations to the USA for their uh, great tie in the World Cup. I don't know what that means. Do they continue playing to the next round or do they get thrown into the sea? I don't, I don't know what it is. Hopefully the latter, but uh, because as I already said, they're not invited back to the country with the whole rainbow flag stunt. Okay. Excuse me, but says if Matt wasn't such a ghoul, he'd have the decency to feel responsible for his verbal treatment of LGBTQ people. I'm just going to take that as a joke because I assume that's what you meant. Probably not, but if I if I I should have the decency to to uh, adopt your viewpoint of my own words. If Matt had the decency, he would he would he would see his own opinions the way that I see them. It's indecent. It's indecent. I say to disagree with me. Good stuff. James Dean says, oh, that magical N-word. When I say N-word, isn't it like I'm saying the actual N-word? Yeah, this was a bit from, I think it was a Bill Barr bit. Uh, Bill, not Bill Barr. Bill Burr, rather, I should say. Bill Barr may have had some, may have had some good uh, comedy bits, but I think it was Bill Burr who pointed this out. That it's like, that's one of the absurdities of just the, this idea. It's like, well, you got to say the, the N-word. You can't say the actual word. You're still saying it because you're conveying it. You're communicating it to somebody else. If you're talking to someone who, who knows what the word is, then you are communicating the word. You're putting the word in their mind. You're communicating it. You're re- referring to it. They know what you mean. They say, oh, it's that word. And so you've still communicated it. The only difference is that you haven't uttered the syllables themselves. But what is the significance of the syllables? What does it matter what syllables? They're just sounds. What, so if you avoid those particular, you could say the first syllable, right? But you can't, you can't go beyond that. And yet you could still convey the word it just doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. Um, let's see. Jim R. says, Matt, I have to admit I'm uncomfortable with you suddenly becoming an advocate for mail-in voting and early voting. We have to hold the line on reforming these systems, not allow ourselves to get sucked into it. Um, no, I'm not an advocate for mail-in voting or early voting. I, I hate both systems. Uh, as you know, if you listen to the show, I'm actually in favor of limiting the vote to same day in person, and even limiting the people who can vote in person. Like, I, I want to limit, I am I'm an unabashed restrictionist when it comes to voting. I think less people should be voting, and everyone who does vote, with few exceptions, should be voting in person on the same day. So that's, that's my opinion, but I'm also a realist. I'm in favor of dealing with and in reality. 
And, and the reality is that early voting and mail-in voting exist. They are happening and Democrats are using them to win elections. That's the reality. So we can either exploit the system for our own ends or we can cross our arms and stamp our feet and say, I don't want any part of it and then never win another election again. So those are your options. Those are the only options. You can, you can learn to exploit the system or you can never win another election. Only two options. That's it. That's all that exists in reality. Now, in an ideal world, other options would exist, but we don't live in that world. And so especially when it comes to elections and politics, it's very important that you operate in reality. You can win elections all day long in, in your fantasy world. That's great. I, I'm all, I am president for life in my fantasy world. I am the theocratic fascist dictator of the entire world for life in my, but we're not in that fantasy world. So we're in reality. Are you going to operate within it or not? Are you going to win the elections or not? I kind of think of it like this. And by the way, if you want, if you want to, if you want to fix the system and you want to put some of these policies in place that we're talking about, you, ha you have to, you have to have power first to do it. You can't do that from the other. You can't change the law from the outside. You have to be in the You have to be uh, running the system, in fact, in order to do that. Which means, in order to, in order to do that, you have to, you have to know how to exploit the system. You have to be able to exploit the very system that you want to change. The left has been very good about this. They've been very good at this for decades. That's how they've gotten to the position that they're in in the culture. They learned how to exploit the systems that they then turned around and changed. I think of it like, uh, you know, back a few years ago, the NFL, speaking of sports, they changed the rules on kickoffs and they moved the kickoff line up so that the, the yard line, so that they're, they're kicking from further up on the field, which means, which, which uh, you know, eliminates kick returns for the other team because it always goes, it goes out back the, through the end zone, ends up with a touchback, and the other team isn't able to return the football. And they did this so that they could, you know, uh, eliminate or negate injuries on, on uh, kickoff returns. Now, I, I didn't like the rule change. I think the kickoff was, the kickoff return is an important part of the sport. I don't like that they took it out of the sport. But if I'm an NFL coach, and it's my turn to kick off, I'm not going to say, well, I don't like this rule where we can move up farther to make sure the other team can't return. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to stick with, with the old kickoff line. I'm going, to, I'm going to kick the ball from further back and give the other team a chance to return it just out of principle. Like you, you've changed. I'm in a position as the kickoff team where you've changed the rules that would benefit me, but I'm not going to take advantage of those rules, and I'm going to put my team in a position to lose on principle. Um. That doesn't make any sense. And that's, to me, it seems like what you're advocating. That we just lose on principle. Which, of course, is what conservatives have been very good at doing for decades. But I'm for a change of pace. The new Daily Wire Plus store is live, and it's your one-stop shop for everything worth giving. Because the fact is, nobody wants a copy of White Fragility. Uh, it's not on anyone's list. Instead, you got to go to dailywire.com slash shop to get the things that you want, like Johnny the Walrus, which has a special deal. It's a book that every kid should read. You can grab one of my limited edition Sweet Baby album t-shirts or uh, for the truly committed, you know who they are. Pick up my Matt Walsh Superfan Bundle. Shipping is free on orders over $75, and with orders over $100, you get a free Leftist Tears tumbler. So skip the cyber woke this holiday and pick up gifts made exclusively from truth. Go to dailywire.com slash shop today. Now let's get to our daily cancellation. Today we cancel a woman named Jessica Esquival, Ph.D., she describes herself as not just a normal physicist, but an Afro-Latinx physicist, which means that her physics are far more inclusive and equitable than regular physics. This is the pitch she makes for herself in her bio on her website, where she describes her professional mission this way. She says, as one of the few Afro-Latinx women to graduate from St. Mary's University with a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering and Applied Physics, and the second to graduate from a, with a PhD in Physics from Syracuse University, Dr. Esquival understands traversing spaces as the only and has a very personal recognition of the importance of equity, diversity, and inclusion. She traverses spaces as the only. I could not possibly come up with a better way to summarize leftist thought. Each individual thinks of themselves as indeed the only. The only what? Well, just the only. And then, of course, the other hallmark of leftist thought, especially when it comes to academics, is that these thoughts are communicated in the wordiest, clunkiest, least eloquent, most awkward way possible. Hence the phrase, traversing spaces. Dr. Esquival, PhD, doesn't simply walk across a room. She 
traverses a space. So if you're sitting across the table from her at a dinner table, uh, she won't ask you to pass the salt. She'll beseech you to convey the sodium chloride from its current position to an approximate location nearer to where she is physically located in space. And you must heed her re request immediately, given that she is, after all, the only, the one and only. Anyway, the one and only Dr. Esquivel, PhD, makes it into the cancellation today because of her recent TED Talk focused on what she calls the queer universe. Dr. Esquivel, PhD, has apparently noticed that her far-left comrades are having a very difficult time using biological science to formulate a coherent defense of queer theory and gender ideology. So she proposes that they abandon that pursuit and instead seek validation and vindication in the field of quantum physics. If gender ideology appears to make no sense from a biological perspective, maybe she can make sense of it from a physics perspective. And if she can't make sense of it, at least she hopes she can confuse people enough to fool them into believing that she made sense of it. That seems to be the goal of this talk titled, The Queer Universe, A Quantum Explanation. So let's watch as much of it as we can bear. Queer, differing in some way from what is usual or normal. As a society, we tend to think in absolutes. Black or white, gay or straight, male or female. But what if I were to tell you that the universe is non-binary? That from cosmological scales to subatomic scales, that the universe is actually super queer. So it isn't such a crazy leap to assume that everything inside our universe is also queer. Does that make you uncomfortable? Or are you cautiously optimistic that the universe may offer some comfort? My name is Dr. Jessica Esquivel. I'm a black, Mexican, queer, neurodivergent woman. I'm also a particle physicist. And today, leveraging my expertise on the intricacies of the quantum realm, we are going to create a reimagining of our universe. Now, I have to say that uh, if nothing else, I appreciate the visuals here. A blue-haired, woke physicist blabbering about the queer universe to an empty stadium while a small group of people walk around behind her, completely ignoring her. She did say she's the only, after all. In this case, she's the only one who attended her own lecture. Nobody also, no, no, notice also how she is ostensibly preparing to give a talk about science, and yet, while listing her credentials, her status as a physicist is listed last after woman, black, Mexican, queer, and neurodivergent. But if she has any legitimate scientific insights to offer, why does it matter which alleged marginalized victim group she belongs to? What relevance does that have? It's hard to imagine a legitimate physicist beginning a speech by announcing his sexual orientation. Like, I wasn't around to hear it myself, but I'm going, to, I'm going to guess that Albert Einstein never opened a lecture by saying, my name is Albert Einstein. I'm a white, cisgender, heterosexual, neurodivergent, German-born theoretical physicist. But that's because Einstein had brilliant ideas, and he was interested in letting his ideas stand or fall on their own merits. Dr. Esquivel, PhD, on the other hand, needs to prop up her ideas on the crutch of victimhood. Let's keep listening. Everything around us, everything from the galaxies filled with stars to the extraordinary depths of our oceans filled with creatures beyond our wildest dreams are made up of a fundamental set of particles. These teensy tiny particles live and interact in a world unlike our own. In our macro world, we tend to think Binary categorizations and absolutes are the norm. But if we tunnel down into the smallest spaces of our universe, we enter a world where queerness and chaos reign supreme. On the contrary, Dr. Esquivel, PhD, uh, you don't need to go down to the bottom of the ocean or look under a microscope to see a world where queerness and chaos reign supreme. That's actually a good description of our culture. Queerness and chaos reign supreme. And yet, if she's right that queerness reigns supreme at the most basic level of reality, if indeed the universe is queer, as she says, then doesn't that mean that queerness doesn't exist? If queer means abnormal, and yet the abnormal is normal, 
then there is no abnormal. If the universe is queer, then nothing is queer. In order for a thing to be abnormal, it must, as she says at the beginning, differ from what is normal, which means that there has to be a normal for the abnormal thing to differ from. So as always, you know, they want to have their queer cake and eat it too. She wants to proudly announce herself as queer, taking pride in her own abnormality, and yet in the next breath insists that she is not abnormal at all because, in fact, everything is queer, everything is gay, everything is non-binary. Even the atoms are gay. Our entire universe is comprised of gay particles, she says. Now, this is obviously totally inane, pseudoscientific, new age babble, but it's also self-contradictory. Ever since the days of Alfred Kinsey, the priests and priestesses of the sexual revolution have tried desperately to convince us that their lifestyle choices and sexual quirks are actually normal, and yet at the same time, they also want to cling to their victimhood card and their identity as a supposedly oppressed minority. So they want to be a minority and the majority at the same time. Now, I won't inflict uh, much more of this on you, but let's hear how she wraps all of this up. All matter is a peculiar conundrum that we don't quite understand. Even confounding still, even though all matter in the universe, including atoms, molecules, humans, plants, planets, galaxies, oceans, all of that only consists of 5% of the visible matter that we can see in our universe. 5%. <laughs> so the rest of it is dark energy and dark matter, and that's another confounding topic for another talk. <laughs> but all this to say that it is an existential fact that we are anomalies in our universe. And the most existential question at the heart of my research is not if we are queer, but why we are queer. And I wonder, if we were to let the chaos of quantum mechanics infiltrate our thinking, if we were to let go of those rigid processes we have and become one with the queer universe, I wonder, maybe, possibly, scientific discoveries would become easier. You know, this woman spent like six years in college came out with a doctorate, and all of that just so that she could tell us to become one with the queer universe. I could not possibly think of a better argument against student loan forgiveness than that. Now, has she achieved her aim with this lecture? Well, if her aim was to somehow prove that non-binary and transgender identities are valid by prattling on about queer subatomic particles, then no, she has not. The fact that particles behave strangely and unexpectedly does not legitimize the illogical and biologically impossible self-perceptions of human beings. Subatomic particles can do lots of things that entire human beings cannot do. They can pass through solid objects, for instance. Dr. Esquivel, PhD, is here taking a common leftist tactic to extraordinary and extraordinarily stupid lengths, where you know they, they often attempt to prove that a person's self-identity and their self-identity claim is legitimate by drawing a comparison to a phenomenon that occurs outside of the human species. So just last week, we heard from someone who attempted to prove that the sex binary among human beings is false by pointing to the fact that some organisms, like amoebas, exist outside of the sex binary. Like amoebas are asexual. They repro reproduce asexually. And that's supposed to prove something about, that's supposed to validate, <laughs> amoebas validate a, a, a claim that a, a man in a dress is making about himself. No, because who, human beings are not amoebas. And though human beings are comprised of like zillions of subatomic particles, a human being is not a subatomic particle individually. But there's a more important point to be made here, I think, which is to note how small and diminished everything becomes when it's filtered through queer theory or gender ideology or whatever you want to call it. I mean, physics is a fascinating field. I don't understand any of it. But I do know that it can unlock and has, has unlocked some of the deepest mysteries of the universe. The more you understand physics, the more you understand the nature of the world, of the cosmos, of reality. And yet this woman, being an adherent to the LGBT religion, isn't interested in the secrets of the universe. The only universe she cares about is the universe of her own small, fragile ego. 
So rather than taking the tool of the tool of physics and directing it out into the world to understand and explore, she points it back at herself to obsess over and justify her own personal and sexual preoccupations. The result is the nonsense you just heard, but worse than being merely nonsense, it's also boring and uninteresting and dull and irrelevant. I suspect there's probably a fair amount of nonsense offered by theoretical physicists, but at least the nonsense is usually fascinating and and directed towards the pursuit of something greater, something noble, you know, understanding the universe. This woman's nonsense, on the other hand, is the result of trying to jam physics into a space under the umbrella of queer theory. She's trying to subordinate it, bring it to heel, fit it into a hierarchy where LGBT self-interest stands at the very top. And this is what happens more and more as institutions and scientific fields are ideologically captured by the far left. They end up churning out a whole bunch of bogus garbage. And worse than that, they stop pursuing truth. They stop looking for it because they're too busy looking in the mirror, talking to themselves. And that is why Dr. Esquival, PhD, is today canceled. That'll do it for this portion of the show as we move over to the uh, members block. Hope to see you there. If not, talk to you tomorrow. Godspeed.